Dear fathers, brothers, and sisters in Christ, this year more voters than ever in history will hold national elections in over 60 countries that include about half of the world's population with results that may prove consequential for years to come. Here in America, the news cycle chirps relentlessly about the presidential election in November with prediction of what will happen if one or another candidate is elected, who they are, how they will govern, what policies they will favor. Today, our Orthodox Church celebration of the Last Judgment focuses on a gospel passage from Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 to 46, which reveals something about the policy of Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed King of God's chosen people, who has been ruling the entire world for about 2,000 years. Our church tells us why we hear the gospel reading today. Quote, so that, after hearing about God's amazing mercy and unconditional love for all humanity, from the parables of the two prior Sundays, that is, the publican and Pharisee, and the prodigal son, we might not become careless in how we live, end quote. I, as a seasoned priest with decades of experience, admit how easily I slide into laziness and negligence on any given day and hour. As a child, I remember being enthralled by the movie The Prince and the Pauper, based upon the novel by Mark Twain. It depicts how Tom, a poor, abused young boy, accidentally comes into contact with Edward, who is the same age and just happens to be next in line as King of England. Since they look a lot alike and could pass as twins, Edward proposes, out of childhood curiosity, to exchange clothing and places with Tom. Prince Edward leaves the safe and privileged confines of the palace to live like a pauper, while poor Tom does the reverse. As the story unfolds, Edward learns what life is really like for too many underprivileged people. Unrecognized by everyone from palace guards to Tom's own family, Edward is subjected to being overlooked, mistreated, even abused, until finally, in jail, he finds a way to convince others of his rightful place in society. Everyone, including Edward's own royal family, is stunned to learn that the pauper is really the prince. In a way, what Jesus tells us today's gospel is similar, since, as the anointed king of the earth, he identifies himself not with the comfortable, the well-off, and the powerful, but with the poor and hungry, sick and strangers, those in prison, that is, with all who are vulnerable and cannot properly care or advocate for themselves. But let's notice some important details. The judgment scene involves all the nations of the world, a biblical expression for Gentiles, outsiders of the covenant community we know as the church, that is, non-Christians, whether people of another faith or none. This includes not just individual persons, but whole groups, even entire nations. Think about what is happening now among nations and groups in our world with frightful developments of war, injustice, and massive movement of refugees and immigrants. Ever wonder how God will judge those who are not members of the church? The gospel today offers a clue. Such people will be held accountable for how they treat Christians in whom Christ the King is particularly present. For when Jesus says, the least of these my brethren, this too is scriptural language that refers in the first place to the church, since our Lord himself redefined family for all time by declaring that those who hear and obey his teaching become members of a new family of faith as his own brothers and sisters. Think for a moment, too, the dramatic experience of the Apostle Paul on his way to Damascus to imprison early believers. In a mystical experience, the risen Lord did not confront Paul by saying, why are you persecuting my followers? But rather, why are you persecuting me? Even though there's no shred of evidence that Paul did anything to Jesus before his passion. 
There's complete identity between Jesus, the anointed king, savior of the world, and each member of his family, the church. Notice today, many fellow believers of ours fall into the same category in Ukraine, Russia, Armenia, the Middle East, Nigeria, and many other places. Also, we observe the reaction of both the sheep, who represent the saved, and the goats, who represent the condemned. Both groups, not just as individual persons, are completely caught off guard. They never realize how the Lord is present among those most in need. Given how critical identity formation is for young people today in America, how many of us inside the church realize Jesus is our true self as persons and in community? Certainly, we Orthodox too will be judged on how we treat or fail to offer acts of mercy to fellow believers who are poor and hungry and homeless, poorly clothed and sick and imprisoned. My first time in Greece while in college, I did not help someone begging on the streets of Athens, rationalizing in my mind, if I give to one, I must give to all, and doing nothing, only to realize how much later this was dead wrong. On the other hand, the church school staff in our parish now recently decided to support and reconnect with an Orthodox orphanage in Kenya that houses, educates, and raises young girls stuck in abject poverty. A simple strategy to do something concrete as a ministry during Great Lent and beyond. However, since we are insiders in the New Covenant community of God's chosen people, we're accountable for far more than outsiders since to those whom much is given, much more will be required. And have we Orthodox not received the most? Which certainly includes working out the free gift of salvation through good works as the fruit of the Holy Spirit that's energizing us in the messiness of our daily lives with loved ones, walking together toward Great Lent. Continually hearing the teaching of Christ and positively responding to it, putting into practice in our lives. From the start of his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, early in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5 through 7, that includes righteous living and seeking justice in society, peacemaking in a world bent on violence, loving our enemies and not judging others, all the way to how we contribute to spreading the good news of salvation through evangelization and missionary work at home and abroad at the end of Matthew's Gospel in a text read at every baptism. We may never preach or enter the mission field, but how willing are we to share our own personal and communal experience of Christ's truth and love and activity in our lives with others around us. We Orthodox don't need to wait until the next national election results to know the policies and standards of the greatest ruler in history. Since Christ, the anointed king of God's people on earth, is far more important, far more powerful, far more president than any president, prime minister, or head of state. His policies are truth and love, mercy and justice, beauty and holiness, revealed to us by God's grace with different standards of accountability depending on how all of us use the gift of our free will as persons, groups, and even nations, depending on how much we've received and how we conduct ourselves. The prior two weeks, the parables of the publican and Protestant and Pharisee and the prodigal son are extraordinary lessons of God's unlimited mercy and unconditional love. These move me to tears every year the more I confront them. But today, we're reminded by Jesus, in a way similar to the prince and the pauper, how God's mysterious judgment holds all humanity accountable for how we're living every day, often in ways we do not fully realize especially to those most in need, both outsiders who will be judged by how they treat Christians and us insiders as Orthodox and Christian 
who have received treasures that are so much greater by the supreme authority in heaven and on earth who identifies with us and is counting on us to be at the forefront of truth and love, mercy and justice for the common good of all.